Hey, you. If you're enjoying the podcast, do us a favor and go into your podcast app right now and tap the subscribe button so you never miss another episode. And if you're into reading, go to weirdtruecrime.com to get written versions of the cases we cover on the show, along with extra visual content. All the fun happens on social media, so come talk to us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at our handle, at Weird True Crime. And I know it's a giant pain, but it would mean the world to us if you would take two minutes to leave us a rating and review. We'll be sure to give you a shout out on future episodes. Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. Roses are red. Violets are blue. We have something dark planned for you. We're so glad you can make it here to join the Darkcast Network on a not-so-sweet sweetheart's date this Valentine's Day. During the dinner portion of our date, some of the Darkcast Network's best podcasts will seduce you with stories about the origin of Valentine's Day, along with sinister tales of murder and hauntings. Hi, my name's Laura. And my name's Jill. And we are the hosts of Crime Divers Podcast. And we are going to tell you today about a Valentine's Day murder. On the 14th of February 2013, a 911 call was made to report a burglary in Peora, Illinois. And when the police got there, they found the body of 39-year-old Denise Luthold, who had been killed with a single gunshot wound to the head. Denise had been married to Nathan for nearly 18 years and they lived in with Denise's parents and their three children, 12-year-old Seth, 10-year-old Julia and 4-year-old Janelle. Denise and Nathan had served as missionaries in Lithuania since 1998 and since then had been dividing their time between the US and Lithuania. On Valentine's Day 2013, the family had breakfast together. Nathan had put chocolates and flowers on the table for Denise and the children were allowed a wee chocolate before heading off to school and nursery. After dropping the kids off, Nathan went to church and Denise had plans to stay at home all day except to pick up four-year-old Janelle from nursery. But later that day, Nathan got a call from the nursery to say that Denise hadn't arrived to pick Janelle up. Nathan called and texted Denise but he got no answer so he went to pick Janelle up and then headed home. It was 3.15pm when the 911 call came in from Nathan saying that his garage door was wide open and one of the windows of his house was broken. He waited outside for the police to arrive and when they did, it was noted that yes, one of the windows was open, but there were no footprints in the muddy ground outside it. Officers entered the house and they saw that the kitchen was a mess. There were cupboards open and drawers pulled out. They walked down the hallway and near the front door, they found Denise's body. She was lying face down in a pool of blood and had been shot in the head. Police had initially initially thought that this was a burglary gone wrong, but as Nathan didn't ask any questions about what was going on and seemed to beha- be behaving oddly, their suspicion of him grew. So he was taken to the police station and questioned for six hours. While he was there, he gave consent for officers to search his car, his laptop and his phone. His in-laws had given consent to search the house and it was noted that Denise's purse and Nathan's wallet hadn't been stolen. They found $300 in a drawer, The TV was still in the living room. Nathan's laptop was still there as well. So if this was a robbery, they didn't seem to have taken much. Denise's car had been stolen, but it was found a short distance away in a car park. Nathan did have three guns though, and two were missing. A 22 caliber Beretta and a 40 caliber Glock. And Denise had been shot with a 40 caliber Glock. A note was found in Denise's day planner, which had been written by herself. And in this note, it said that Nathan was running around with a 20 year old. And it also said things like he thought she was a bad mother and that he didn't love her after 17 years of marriage. One part read, I really don't think there's anything I have done or not done to deserve this. I have never been good enough or done enough for you. I know you want me dead. I'm not stupid, but I'm not that brave. I quit. I will not please you anymore. No more of that game. If I haven't pleased you in 17 years, then nothing I will do will do it. So who was this 20 year old? that Nathan was having an affair with. Well, this was Aina Dobelate. 
She had met Nathan and Denise in her home country of Lithuania when she was just six years old. Her family were very much involved with the church and the two families were friends and kept in touch over the years. When Aina was 18, the Lutholds decided to sponsor her as an exchange student as she wanted to study ministry work and music. She attended college in Florida from 2010 to 2011 and her and Nathan would stay in about 20 hotels in total during that time. When her school found out, she was made to withdraw from the program. I'm assuming this was because she was studying ministry work and it wasn't appropriate for her to be having an affair with a married man. So she moved into the home of Nathan, Denise, her parents and their children. Nathan and Aina would spend spa days together and Nathan would pay for everything. So Aina would be getting massages, her hair done and many other treatments. He also took her away on holiday to Europe in the summers of 2011 and 2012 and they even had a shared bank account so that Nathan could put money in for Aina to spend on food clothing and general living expenses. Armed with this information and the fact that there were witnesses on that Valentine's Day, Nathan was arrested. In court, a neighbour called Diane Parrish stated that she was leaving her house at about 12.20 that day with her husband as she noticed a man walking along the street towards Luthold's house and thought he looked suspicious as he was only wearing a hoodie and it was about minus 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. So she asked her husband to slow down so she could get a good look at him and she later positively identified him as Nathan Luthold. So this placed Nathan at his house close to the time of Denise's death and not at church like he said he was. Another witness said that she was visiting her sister who lived nearby and she heard a gunshot at about 12.30 that day. So that would have lined up with the time that Nathan was seen by Diane Parrish heading towards home. When Aina was questioned, she said that she had never told Nathan she loved him and at first denied the relationship but an email was produced in court from Aina to Nathan and it partly said, quote, I let you down. From now on, I want to do all that I can for you and this relationship. I am so blessed to have you in my life, end quote. She denied having any part in Denise's murder but she did act a bit suspicious. When Nathan texted Aina on the day of the murder to tell her that their house had been burgled, she replied, interesting, with a smiley face. She later agreed that this wasn't an appropriate response. What was interesting was that Nathan's parents were paying for Aina's attorney and they told her not to talk to the police. This money was from an account that was set up for the Luthold children. Aina didn't attend Denise's funeral, which was seen as very strange since they lived in the same house, had known each other since Aina was six years old, and Denise had helped sponsor her to study in the US. So of course, everyone wondered why, if Aina wasn't having an affair with Denise's husband, why wouldn't she attend a funeral? While Nathan had been on remand, he had been an inmate with a guy called David Smith, and they struck up a friendship. After they had been friends for a while, Nathan asked David for legal advice on a hypothetical situation. But David told Nathan he had to be honest with him. So Nathan told him that on Valentine's Day, when he left the house, he parked his car somewhere and walked back home through the woods. Denise must have popped out because she wasn't home when he got there. So he hid in the closet. Then when she got home, they had words and he shot her in the head. David also said that Nathan had considered poisoning Denise at first, but then decided on shooting at her instead. And when investigators searched his laptop, they saw that he had looked for a silencer for a 40 caliber Glock. There were also searches for how to hide the sound of a gunshot, how to silence a Glock 40, and also searches for giving someone who is not diabetic insulin. He had also looked for other ways to murder someone and how to erase an iPad, but he obviously didn't manage to do that. Nathan told David that killing his wife was a Valentine's Day present to his girlfriend. It took the jury just 90 minutes to find Nathan Luthold guilty of murdering his wife Denise Luthold, and he was sentenced to 80 years in prison. Thank you for listening, and if you'd like to hear more from our podcast Crime Divers, then you'll find us on your favorite podcast platform. Hello, my name is Jackie Moranti, and I'm the host of Cause of Death, 100 Seconds to Midnight. My show is all about the things not true crime that will kill you. I talk about science and global crises through the lens of my past experience as an infectious disease researcher and history. You'll love it. Just go listen. Today, I'm going to talk about something that is true crime. Sort of. I'm talking about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Prohibition was a disaster. It was called the nation's noble experiment, but it was a total and outright failure. One of the more serious problems that came from it was gang violence. 
Don't think this just came up in the last 20 years. No, 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 no. Anytime there is a black market for anything, gangs will be involved. And in the Roaring Twenties, when Prohibition was at its peak, gangs were everywhere. Liquor was still flowing, and bootleggers and syndicates were providing it. Let's take a trip back in time. It's February 14, 1929, and two police officers enter a warehouse at 2122 North Clark Street in Chicago. This warehouse was where George Bugs Moran stored illegal alcohol prior to sale. Seven of his enforcers from the Northside gang were keeping an eye on the warehouse. At some point, two men dressed as police officers kicked in the door. The men inside assumed that it was a raid, and everyone just lined up against the wall to be frisked, arrested, and processed. It was just another day at the office. What happened next was complete mayhem. Once the, quote, police had the gangsters lined up against the wall, two more civilian men joined them. All four threw back their jackets, pulled Tommy guns, and began shooting. Seventy shots were fired, and no man was left standing. When the smoke cleared, all seven men from the Northside gang were dead or dying on the floor. The four men who had done the shooting just turned and walked out the door. Liquor was a lucrative but very dangerous business in the 20s and 30s. Bugs and his Northside gang were bitter rivals of Al Capone. After taking over operations from former mob boss Johnny Torrio in 1925, Capone ran his outfit with an iron fist and he was known to gun down anyone who got in the way of his success. Capone was the only suspect in the murders. One of the enforcers who was shot, Frank Hawk Gusenberg, was still alive when the real police arrived. He refused to say anything about who had done the shooting, though, and he died a short time later from his injuries. Bugs Moran would also look at Capone for the murders. He had not been at the warehouse that day, but there had been bitter feuds among both gangs for months. The North Side Gang was the only thing in the way of Capone dominating all the gang activity in Chicago, and Capone wasn't about to let that opportunity slip by. For months, the battle raged between the two syndicates all over Chicago. Moran's gang would hijack Capone's shipments, kill his allies, and continue to compete for business. Capone's gang would retaliate in much the same manner. After the massacre, Moran would tell police only Capone kills like that. Capone was in Florida at the time, so his alibi was solid, but he had a whole syndicate working for him. He wasn't short of men who would do the deed if he paid them enough. No one was ever tried or convicted of the murders, but Al Capone would forever be surmised as the man who orchestrated the killing. The massacre did what Capone intended. It left Moran to be seen as weak, and his North Side gang eventually diminished into nothing. By the end of 1929, Capone was completely in control of the Chicago Syndicate, and would remain that way until he was arrested and convicted of tax evasion in 1931. Gang violence hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 90 years. Gangs are still little businesses serving up illegal treats to the masses who will pay the high price for whatever ill-gotten gains they're selling. In the 1920s and 30s, it wasn't just illegal liquor that was for sale on the black market. Just like today, there were people being trafficked, drugs, children for sale, loan sharking, whatever you wanted that you couldn't get legally. Today, things aren't much different. Gangs are still the same. There are just more of them. Even the merchandise hasn't changed very much. Drugs have taken the place of liquor, but the rest is all the same. Chicago is still one of the most violent cities in the country for gang violence, and that may never change. The warehouse where the St. Valentine's Massacre occurred was torn down in 1967, so all that's left there are memories. But those memories are strong in Chicago. It's an historic connection to the present, but it's not a good one. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it's going to change anytime soon. I'll be talking more about gang violence and the causes in a future episode. Until that comes out, there are 56 more episodes to binge on my feet. Go check out Cause of Death 100 Second Midnight. I want to thank the Dark Cast Network for letting me tell this story, and I want to thank all of you for listening. 
Hi, this is Molly. And Cody. And we're from Over the Fence True Crime Podcast. We are former neighbors, co-workers, co-hosts, and number three on each other's children's emergency contact cards. True story. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find us on your favorite podcast streaming platform. And tonight we have the case for you of the Sweetheart Murders. Sabrina Gonzalez and John Regans lived in the town of Davis, California in 1980 when they met while working for the town's recreation department. The relationship was really just blossoming. Even at the age of 18, these two had big plans for their own lives, individually, but also as a couple. They wanted to get married and have a lot of kids, but first they had plans to attend the University of California, Davis, also known as UC Davis. Sabrina was a beauty inside and out. She was kind and a caring soul with a love for animals. She wanted to be a physical therapist. John was what you would think of as a quintessential American hometown hero. He thrived in high school sports and was revered in the community. He was handsome and stood out with his red hair and green eyes. John was an aspiring doctor and he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps who was a prominent physician. These two seemed to be meant for each other and had the world at their fingertips and they were adored by all that knew them. On the evening of December 20th, 1980, a thick fog had settled over the town of Davis. Sabrina and John were due at her older sister's surprise birthday party on this evening. But once the party was over, it was noticed by all that Sabrina and John had never arrived. What at first began as a disappointment in her younger sister for not attending her party turned into great worry. It was uncharacteristic of Sabrina and of John to not show to such a big party and then to continue to be unable to be reached afterwards. Panic set in the following morning when the two were still nowhere to be found. Again, the prior night, December 20th, was extremely foggy winter night. So the first thought of the Riggins and Gonzalez families were that the couple had gotten into a car accident. When they weren't able to find the vehicle immediately and didn't hear of any accident from the hospital or police, the family reached out to the Sacramento County Sheriff's Office to report the couple as missing. And in true 1980s fashion, the police stated that they had to wait 24 hours before they could begin the search. But the police really felt that the couple had probably had just run off and eloped. The families knew that this wasn't the case. They also knew they weren't going to wait around for 24 hours for the police to take action. However, despite the family's search efforts, it was still the police that made the first discovery, which would lead to some answers, at least as to where Sabrina and John were. It was when police finally started their search, which was about a day later, that they found John's van, abandoned about 20 to 30 miles outside of Davis. The vehicle had obviously been rummaged through. Several hours later, the bodies of John and Sabrina were found in the brush nearby. John had suffered a blow to his head. His mouth and eyes were duct taped and his throat had been cut. Due to the blow to his head, it was presumed that John had tried to fight against his and Sabrina's murder or murderers. Sabrina's throat had also been cut and she had been covered with duct tape in the same fashion as John, so eyes and mouth. In addition, there were signs that she had been sexually assaulted. These were quickly coined by media as the Sweetheart Murders. What was clear was that the perpetrator had come prepared to commit these crimes, hence the duct tape and the abandoned vehicle. To leave a vehicle abandoned, there had to have been a plan or a means to get away. What the police were able to take away from the crime scene was clothing from the victims to test for bodily fluids, along with a blanket that was intended to be a gift for Sabrina's sister that was in the van. It had originally been wrapped, as it was a present, but it, then it had been unwrapped, likely by the attacker or attackers, and appeared to be soiled. In addition, the van had hundreds of latent fingerprints for investigators to process. The police were able to piece together that the killer had been waiting for John and Sabrina to leave the house that night, and the fog had acted as a perfect cover for their evil intentions. A composite sketch was made of the suspect, and let me tell you that this is probably one of the most terrifying composite sketches I've ever seen. The suspect looks like a straight up wild man. However, despite a composite sketch though, bodily fluid samples and fingerprints, there's no suspects. Mm. No one knows why anyone would want to do this couple any harm. Right. And it wasn't until about six years later when a tip led police to look at a similar double murder of a couple in the Sacramento area that had taken place about a month prior to the murder of John mm -hmm. and Sabrina. This was the murder of Mary Beth Sowers and Craig Miller two Sacramento State students. For those of you unfamiliar with the area, Sacramento is just about 20 minutes from Davis. When both of these individuals had been found, they were found in remote areas. They were found separately from one another, which was a little different, but both had been shot and Mary Beth Sowers had been sexually assaulted. You can see some parallels and ultimately Gerald and Charlene Gallego, yes, a married couple, mm -hmm. were found responsible for the murder of Mary Beth Sowers and Craig Miller, oh. along with the murders of eight other young women. Oh. 
That yeah. Talk about a match made in hell. Yeah. We have like the sweetheart couple and then the couple from hell. But getting back on track, police start trying to find parallels between the two cases, more of them to link them together. But Gerald Gallego had an extremely solid alibi for the night that John and Sabrina were killed. He was in jail. Oh, well, that's going to do it. However, police think, okay, maybe it wasn't that Gerald didn't commit the murder, but maybe it was done on his behalf to clear him of his guilt of the other murders. Like, oh, the person's still out there doing it. Police thought maybe John and Sabrina's murders were a copycat crime. And who would go through the killing of two innocent people to clear a guilty man from their connection of the killing of two other innocent yeah, people? Yeah, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, all. you know, the brother of the murderer, of course, <laughs> Gerald's brother, David Hunt specifically that's who's gonna who would do it so he was a career felon with just a prior kidnapping charge but the police didn't think he acted alone they believed that he needed help to pull off this crime so they believed that his co-conspirators were his wife and then one of his regular partners in crime this trio were referred to as the hunt group because of david hunt so he had his own group his own posse to yeah. go commit this crime the hunt group all to avenge his just brother play off that last name a little bit you know mm -hmm. with this storyline with zero physical evidence, mind you. The group of three was arrested in 1989 and they were facing a trial and if found guilty of the sweetheart murders could face the death penalty. The police also pressed another accomplice to try and get information from him. For months, they drilled this guy and he refused to give them information on the sheer fact that he had no information because they weren't involved in the murders. Yeah, they didn't do it. But after this accomplice won't flip on his friends, because there literally wasn't anything to flip mm. on, he was actually also arrested for his involvement in the Sweetheart murders. Oh my gosh. So you have four people in jail. Mm -hmm. In January of 1993, after most of the Hunt group had been in jail for nearly three years at this point, mm -hmm. it's the night before the Hunt group is to go to trial, and a key piece of evidence is uncovered. That blanket that had been found in the van that I mentioned that was a gift for her sister it had been sent to the lab for processing back in 1980. There were four semen stains on it. And 12 years after it had been sent to the county crime lab, those stains were processed. It seems that the blanket was just never turned over when it was processed. And the semen stains were on the opposite side of the blanket that the crime lab processed. But thankfully, they finally did, because on the night before trial, they asked for samples from everybody and I think one of them was advised not to give a sample. And he said, hell yeah, I'm giving a sample. Mm -hmm. I know my DNA is not on that blanket. Yeah. And this is the only thing that's going to clear me. Right. So they tested those semen stains and samples against everyone in the hunt group. And the samples didn't match a single one of them. Wow. And they were all released. So in the early 90s, there was no DNA database to compare the DNA. So they needed someone to compare it to. So that's how they did that with yeah, the hunt right. group. They had the samples. So once they had cleared the members of the so-called Hunt group, investigators were basically back to square one. Mm -hmm. However, at least now they had a DNA sample for comparison if they were to come across another potential suspect or lead. Right. Unfortunately, the case went cold for about another decade. In the early 2000s, with the evolution of DNA technology, a journalist by the name of Joel Davis that attended high school with John Riggins, he prodded the cold case unit of this area, particularly about this case. He's like, reopen that case, run it again with the technology we have now. Cold case units only open certain mm -hmm. cases up again. So with his prodding and persistence, they did. Because at this point in time, there was an FBI DNA database to run comparisons to. So he's like, just give it a shot. And they did. And there was a hit. And what a hit it was. The DNA sample concluded a match, which was one in 240 trillion. Well, that's quite the match. So... The perpetrator, Richard Hirschfield, a convicted sex offender with victims that were both children and adults. Oof. After obtaining the DNA hit, police were also able to place him with likely being in the area at the time of the murders. Not only did he have known associates that lived very close to where Sabrina lived in Davis, his brother Joseph lived relatively close to where John and Sabrina and their van had been found. Investigators knew they needed to talk to Joseph because it did seem that Richard may have needed some help in the commission of this crime. Richard would have needed a ride, or at the very least, even if he didn't have an accomplice, they would need to question his brother regarding Richard's behavior around the time of mm -hmm. the murders. Mm -hmm. When they go to question Joe, investigators recognize that he is literally, literally, visibly shaken when Ooh. investigators discuss the presence of DNA evidence at the crime scene. After investigators left, the very next day, Joseph goes into his garage and completes suicide by carbon monoxide poisoning. Wow. He left a suicide note, which some of it's been redacted, but it does include the following statement, quote, I have been living with this whore for 20 years. 
Richard did commit those murders, but I was there. I didn't kill anyone, but my DNA is still there. Although we do not know what his actions were at the crime scene, we know that he opted for suicide instead of seeing the outcome of whatever his actions were that day or that evening. Well, then you probably, if he didn't do it, you'd assume he probably helped move the bodies. Yeah. In his suicide note, he also apologized to his wife, who was none the wiser. He had never confided in her about this. Mm -hmm. They, by all means, had a happy Mm -hmm. relationship, a happy marriage. She didn't even know much about his brother, Richard, just that they didn't have much of a relationship Mm -hmm. because he hadn't even been in his life very much. Really? After more than a decade of defensive tactics and appeal, the case against Richard Hirschfield finally went to trial on November 5th, 2012. A jury of seven men and five women deliberated less than three hours, and Richard Hirschfield was found guilty in the murders of both John and Sabrina. In January of 2013, the judge upheld the death penalty sentence. Richard Hirschfield currently sits on California's death row in San Quentin. As a tribute to the two young lives that were lost way too soon and before they had a chance to reach their full potential, on the grounds of the University of California Davis campus, a tree stands in the memory of the two murder college sweethearts, and the Warm Remembrance Family Play Area stands in the Davis community to honor John and Sabrina's legacies. And that is the case of the Sweetheart Murders. Hey there, I'm CJ and I host a little podcast called Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBT. I cover crimes committed by and against the LGBTQ plus community. My show is not just for the LGBTQ, it's for everyone. So please check it out. And as always, I'm proud to be partnered with Darkcast Network. The newlywed couple of 38-year-old Racina Vale and 39-year-old Tiffany Noden, well, their relationship was anything but sweet. Don't get me wrong here, it had its sweet moments as most relationships do, but the sour moments were downright devastating. The couple had been in an on-again, off-again relationship. And the last time they were on again, they decided to get married in December of 2013. I'm not sure why people do the whole on-again, off-again, merry-go-round thing. To me, it seems rather toxic. But in January 2004, they set up house in an apartment in San Carlos, California, near San Diego. As far as children, the couple owned two fur babies, dogs and Racina's human daughter lived with her dad in the San Diego area. Prior to this, they lived in Colorado, but they moved to San Carlos to be where Racina grew up. She was now physically closer to her dad and daughter. After six months of marriage and living together in their San Carlos apartment, the honeymoon was over, as the saying goes. Neighbors reported major fights between the couple where the police had to be called to break things up. But during their sweet days, they'd walk their dogs together, and during their not-so-sweet days, expect the police to visit. Some of the reason behind the couple's fights were due to a drug addiction that Tiffany had. Racina worked at the Barona Indian Casino. In May, Tiffany showed up and paused a scene here between her and Racina. It was so heated, Tiffany had to be escorted off the casino's property. And this bothers me. You never screw with someone's livelihood. I had an ex who would do this to me as well. Hey, this is my job, woman. Go away. Fight with me at home. It wasn't like she wasn't benefiting from my paycheck. Sheesh. The end of May, Racina had sent out messages to friends and her family that her and Tiffany's marriage was over. She was going to file for divorce. On June 5, 2014, Racina was on her way back to work at 5.30 a.m. A neighbor man was also on his way to work. He saw her and Tiffany by Racina's car. When Racina left, he waved and said hello to Tiffany. He didn't respond to him. When he got home from work later that evening, his wife told him that there had been a murder in the apartment complex. The man was shocked. A little after 6 p.m., police had received a call from a defense attorney. He stated there was a possible homicide victim in an apartment, and he gave the complex address and apartment number. I'll get back to how he knew that information later. When police arrived to check out the scene, they found a deceased, naked Racina lying on her bed. She'd been stabbed in her arm, 
her stomach, her chest, and badly bludgeoned to death with an object. Tiffany was last seen leaving the apartment complex late afternoon with the couple's dogs. She called an aunt who lives in San Bernardino, California. She asked her aunt to pick her up. Her aunt said she sounded stressed and panicked. She was worried about Tiffany and her aunt obliged, picking her up and taking her to her home in San Bernardino. While with her aunt, Tiffany called a defense lawyer. See, I told you we'd come back to that part. Tiffany gave some specifics, but she decided not to go through with meeting with the attorney. The attorney's phone call to the police is what helped them find Racina. Tiffany left her aunt's home before her aunt could find out what she had done to Racina. Her aunt had no clue where Tiffany had went. News reports about Tiffany went out asking anyone who might see her to call the police. They wanted to question her for information about Racina's murder. Tiffany avoided police for 20 days before they finally caught up with her in San Diego. Yep, she was back. She was taken in for questioning where she admitted killing her wife. She was charged with murder and she went to trial. At the trial, her public defender said drugs played a huge part of why Tiffany murdered her wife. The drugs clouded her judgment. Come on, defender, really? I know some drugs can make people violent, but that really sounds just like an excuse to me. Tiffany pled guilty to second-degree murder, and she was sentenced 20 years to life in prison. In prison, Tiffany had been heard complaining that she thought Rosina was cheating on her. Still not a reason to murder Tiffany. If you're in love, cherish it. And whatever you do, don't mess it up. And remember, you matter. And it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. And be sure to listen to Beyond the Rainbow, True Crimes of the LGBT. It can be found wherever you get your podcast. But don't start at the beginning. I'd like to keep you around. Maybe start with season three. Oh, and happy Valentine's Day. Or as I like to call it, happy Singles Awareness Day. Hey, spooky friends. It's Angelina. And Aurora. From Murder Murder News, the true crime cult with all of the flower crowns and none of the flavor aid. There's no shame in spending Valentine's Day alone, but if you'd like some company, let's dive into that box of chocolates together and explore a historical crime from Valentine's past. 14 years ago today, 25-year-old Tiana Notis was murdered after being harassed and stalked by an ex-boyfriend. The system should have protected Tiana, who was terrorized by her ex for months and had gone to the police over 30 times to report violations of his restraining order. But Tiana soon found that the police had no plan to protect her or stop her ex, even though she was able to provide evidence of his escalating harassment and threats. Tiana's family always knew she was special. From the age of six, they suspected she was a prodigy, always outperforming her classmates academically. She started attending college classes her senior year of high school. She earned her bachelor's in political science at the University of Hartford and went on to pursue her master's in communication. The sky was the limit for Tiana, who planned to become an attorney after encouragement from her mom, Kathy, because she said Tiana loved a good debate. While in school, Tiana dated her college sweetheart, Robert, but after five years together, they ended their relationship. Dating apps were not a thing in the 2000s, and meeting people online through social media still felt a little scary and embarrassing. In 2007, Tiana met James Carter on MySpace. She wasn't looking for anything serious after ending her relationship with Robert, but she agreed to meet up with James, but settled on a place in public, just to be safe. James seemed to check all of her boxes. He owned his own home, something almost unheard of today, He was a manager at a finance company, and he didn't have children yet. But Tiana would later find out that everything he told her was a lie. Six months into the relationship, James was arrested for domestic abuse of a previous girlfriend. He was sentenced to six months in prison. This was a big wake-up call for Tiana. Not only did she now know James was capable of violence, but she also found out the incident had taken place while he was cheating on her. 
She soon learned that this was not the first time he had been arrested for a violent crime, and he had a rap sheet for other crimes, including assault. Tiana broke up with James, but once out of jail, the stalking started. Tiana got a restraining order against him. When her dad, Alvin, asked what had happened, Tiana responded, quote, he's just bugging me. He won't leave me alone. When James found out Tiana had filed a restraining order against him, he reciprocated by filing one against her. He told police that she had punched him in the face and kicked the taillight out of his car. Even though he didn't have an injury, he was granted the restraining order. But James was just getting started. Tiana started receiving emails from an account named Jessica Banderas, stating she was the ex-girlfriend of James. The emails contained messages saying things like, Trust me, baby girl, you're going to lose everything. And as God is my witness, punishment is on the way, so be prepared. You will have bad luck, you hear me? Remember this email when karma bites you in the ass. On January 13th, 2009, Tiana went back to the police with harassing emails from James. The police told her that unless she could prove the emails had come from him and not his ex, there was nothing they could do. In the meantime, she continued to receive emails from James, and he was calling her at the university where she was working. He started showing up at her apartment, her job, and even while she was out shopping. Tiana attempted to report him to the police again and again and was sent away each time. She told her mother they had treated her like dirt and insinuated she was lying. Her mother, Kathy, was so frustrated that she too called the police, telling them she wasn't about to let her daughter become a statistic. The officer shrugged her off, telling her nothing would happen to her daughter. James filed another restraining order against Tiana, claiming she had sent him a flyer with her name, picture, and phone number on it. And at this point, things escalated to the point where they both had to appear in court. Tiana brought the emails from James as evidence, and since he hadn't really received a flyer from Tiana, he came empty-handed. They were given six-month restraining orders against each other, and James continued to escalate. On February 7, 2009, Tiana's tires on her car were slashed at her home. She knew it was James, but couldn't prove it. Her dad, Alvin, wanted to help and decided to install security cameras at her apartment. He installed cameras with one pointing at her car in the parking lot. That night, Alvin also coached Tiana on what to do if she was under attack. They role-played an attack and safety plan just in case she needed it. On February 13th, the abuse continued. James called her work. A coworker agreed to act as a witness of the harassing calls. When she went to the police station, she was told by an officer that the restraining order was fake. They told her they would only accept it if the police station that issued the restraining order faxed it over. Why they couldn't recognize a restraining order and why they couldn't call the police station on her behalf, we'll never know. But it's just one bad call made by a series of officers that resulted in Tiana's murder. In all, Tiana had filed over 30 complaints against James and nothing was ever done to protect her. That night, Tiana got home from the police station at 7.20 p.m. to find a note on her door from James. The note read, Tiana, forgive me. I never cheated on you. If I'm lying, may God take my life. Forgive me for everything else I have done. On the morning of Valentine's Day 2009, Tiana attempted to enlist the help of those who swear an oath to serve and protect us one last time. She went to the police station where she had been granted a restraining order with the note left by James the prior evening. She was told they would contact James, have him provide a handwriting sample, and assuming he had left the note, they would arrest him for violating the restraining order. But that's not what happened. Instead, they called James and basically just scolded him. They told him if he violated his restraining order again, they would have to arrest him. James was now furious that Tiana had turned him in and a man with a history for violence was on the loose. Tiana, not knowing that James hadn't been arrested, was in the mood for a celebration. Alvin warned his daughter not to go near her home until he had been arrested, and Tiana decided to play it safe and stay with her mom for the weekend. She stopped home quickly to get a bag and some laundry to bring to her mom's. 
In the meantime, the now angry James hid in the shadows behind Tiana's apartment, waiting for her to get home. As Tiana approached her front door, James snuck up behind her with a knife. He stabbed her nearly 20 times, stabbing her twice through the heart. Tiana cried out and a neighbor came to help. She was able to call 911 at 9.41 p.m. Here's her panicked call. Where are you? One, I'm bleeding to death. Stand on the phone with me. That boyfriend just stabbed me to death. Who's there with you? Who's there with you? You're not going to die. You're not going to die. Yeah. Okay. Now stay on the phone with me. Tiana lost consciousness during her call to 911. She was rushed to a nearby hospital but didn't survive. James was arrested an hour after Tiana died and was charged with her murder. Between Tiana naming him as her attacker in the 911 call and the video from the surveillance camera, there was plenty of evidence against him. In 2012, he was found guilty and sentenced to 60 years in prison. Tiana's family worked with the Connecticut state senator to fight for tougher laws against domestic violence. They also started the Tiana Angelique Notice Foundation, to provide educational resources to prevent domestic violence. In 2014, Tiana's family also won a $10 million wrongful death lawsuit against the officers who ignored her plea for help. We thank you for listening. If you'd like some more company during one of the most hated of holidays, you can find Murder Murder News wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes come out every Friday, each one featuring a story from the corresponding week in true crime history told from a victim first standpoint. Happy Valentine's Day, spooky friends. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm Dawn, the host of the podcast Scottish Murders, which focuses entirely on murders that have been carried out in Scotland or murders of Scottish people. So, obviously, our Valentine's-esque story for the Darkcast Network Not-So-Sweet Sweetheart episode is a tale from Scotland. The Scottish Highlands are well known for their dramatic landscapes, beautiful castles and truly fascinating history. And for Valentine's Day, what could be more romantic than visiting the iconic Elendonan Castle, where many a couple have tied the knot? or the peaceful and beautiful Isle of Skye, which was placed at the top spot by a Visit Scotland survey of the most romantic places to visit, where couples can relax and enjoy a quieter, more sedate, but absolutely breathtaking Valentine's Day. Glen Coe, also located in the Scottish Highlands, is a glen shaped by volcanic activity, is the home of Scottish mountaineering, and is popular with hillwalkers and climbers. However, Glen Coe is also known for sorrow and heartache, as on the 13th of February 1692, an eruption not of the ancient volcanic activity of millions of years ago, but of betrayal and violence took place, which was triggered by events a few years prior. It was in 1685 that King James VI of Scotland and King James II of England took to the throne of both countries and quickly established his unpopularity within the Protestant majority of the British Isles by trying to re-establish Catholicism as the official religion. This culminated in 1688 when he produced a Catholic heir and this prompted many high-level members of the British Parliament to invite the King's oldest daughter, Mary, and her husband, William of Orange, to claim the throne, which resulted in what was known as the Glorious Revolution of 1688-1689, which resulted in King James fleeing to France, and William and Mary being crowned joint monarchs. However, King James and his Stuart heirs had many supporters, especially in the Scottish Highlands, with his supporters being known as Jacobites, after the Latin for James, Jacobus, and who rebelled against the new monarchs, including winning the Battle of Killiecrankie in 1689, but success was fairly limited in nature. What this rebellion did show was that there was an ever-increasing unrest forming in the Scottish Highlands. There had been long-standing feuds between the clans over the previous hundred years, but this latest unrest just amplified the division between the clans even more. 
King William III, formerly known as William of Orange, offered to pardon the Jacobites who took part in the uprising, but only if their clans swore an oath of allegiance to the new monarchy by January 1, 1692, an offer that originally had a financial incentive, but was really just a threat that their clans either pledge their allegiance or be punished. This was further proven when government forces were positioned at a new fortress, Fort William, and were attacking Jacobites' strongholds, which would only be stopped by accepting the king's offer. So despite their loyalties to King James, he agreed that the clans that were loyal to him could be released from their pledge and sent word from France. News reached the Macdonalds, who were one of the clans loyal to King James, on the 29th of December, 1691. So, with only a few days to go before the deadline, Chief MacIan made his way to Fort William to give the oath of allegiance to William III. However, once there, he was told that no one present could accept his oath, but instead he was told to make his way to Inverary, which was 70 miles or 112 kilometres away over mountains and snow in the heart of the territory of the Campbells, who were historic rivals of the Macdonalds. By the 2nd of January 1692, he had made it, and although it was already a day after the deadline had passed, he still hoped his oath would be accepted. However, there would be a further delay, as he found that the person who had to receive his oath, Sir Colin Campbell, was away celebrating Hogmanay. It would be a further three days before Campbell returned to Inverary, and he was reluctant to accept the oath, as the deadline had passed days before. However, he did finally agree to accept the oath, allowing the chief of the MacDonald clan to return home knowing that they pledged themselves to William III. However, the Scottish government was very suspicious of the clans of the Highlands and felt they were savages who needed to be brought under English law. So when news reached Edinburgh of the oath being delivered late, Sir John Dalrymple, the Secretary of State for Scotland, declined the oath. There had always been plans to deal with the clan system in the Highlands, so this gave the Secretary of State an excuse to act against the MacDonald clan and wipe them out as an example to demonstrate that any rebellion against the new monarchy and the government would not be tolerated. The MacDonald clan formed a small part of the much larger Clan Donald, who were very influential over other Highland clans and striking a blow against them would represent attacking everything Sir John Dalrymple, the Secretary of State for Scotland, hated of the Highlands. However, the Macdonalds were not well liked by those clans who neighboured them in the Highlands, as they would carry out raids and cattle rustling, and along with it being in an isolated location, and Glencoe having very few escape routes, made them vulnerable to attack. On the 1st of February 1692, over a hundred government soldiers of Argyll's Regiment of Foot, commanded by Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon, arrived in Glencoe, with papers stating that they were there to collect tax arrears and were to stay at the homes of the Macdonalds. The soldiers themselves, once in Glencoe, were to await further orders. The Macdonalds saw this activity as a test of their loyalty to King William III, so they gladly welcomed the soldiers into their homes in the Glen for around a couple of weeks, which included sharing food from their limited winter supplies as well as drinks. The mood was full of welcome for the soldiers, with many stories being told of Cayleys being held, games of shinty being played, and even romances between the soldiers and some of the locals. It would be the evening of the 12th of February, 1692, when Robert Campbell received further orders signed by the King, stating that on the following morning, the 13th of February, they were to fall upon the rebels, the Macdonalds of Glencoe, and put all to the sword under 70. The orders also stated, you are to secure all the avenues that no man escape and that, if the orders were not obeyed, that Campbell and his soldiers would face the same fate. There were also two other regiments positioned in Balahulish and Kinlochleven to cut off any possible escape routes from the Glen. The massacre began with a simultaneous attack in Invercoe, Inveregan and Achnacoe, along with killings throughout the Glen, as any Macdonalds who were fleeing were pursued by the soldiers. 
who would also drag men from their beds and then their homes were burned. Women, children and the elderly were put out into the snow, with many of them dying of exposure to the harsh winter weather. 38 McDonald's were murdered directly, including Chief McIan, who, when rising from his bed as soldiers entered, was shot in the back. Many more of the McDonald's lost their lives in the mountains, however some were led to safety by John and Alexander, who were the two sons of Chief McIan. Others were able to hide themselves, and many more escaped via Glen Etive. It is thought that so many McDonald's were able to escape due to the kindness of the McDonald's making friends with the soldiers, so when it came time to carry out the orders to kill them, many of the soldiers were unable to do so. There were rumours of soldiers allowing people to escape or deliberately missed shooting at those they had been ordered to kill. Even Robert Campbell himself, who commanded the soldiers, is said to have assisted two men to escape. The men, women and children of Clan MacDonald who had escaped the Glencoe Massacre, instead of feeling love, joy and happiness the following day, on Valentine's Day 1692, all that was felt was betrayal. News of the Glencoe Massacre spread, and the Jacobites even produced pamphlets that were distributed and used to raise awareness of what had happened as far away as London. Stories were told of what happened from both survivors and soldiers, which prompted an inquiry in 1695 into what happened. The inquiry found that the massacre carried out on the 13th of February 1692 in Glencoe was indeed murder although it was not clear if King William III knew the extent of the orders he had signed, and he escaped any blame. Sir John Dalrymple, the Secretary of State for Scotland, was the true mastermind of the Glencoe Massacre, and he was forced to resign, although he was later reinstated in a higher position. Robert Campbell, who led the attack, remained in the army and was sent overseas to fight, but died in poverty in 1696. The goal of the Glencoe Massacre was to break up the clans and set an example to those who would stand against the new king and government, but resulted in having the opposite effect and actually strengthened the convictions of those in the Highlands that Scotland was not equal to England and united the Jacobite clans, making additional uprisings in the future inevitable. The echoes of the Glencoe Massacre have rippled through the centuries, and the events then have not been forgotten. It is hard to imagine that the beautiful, picturesque landscape of Glencoe was once the site of such a terrible atrocity, carried out by people welcomed into the homes of their hosts, although it was thankfully tempered by the bonds of friendship that were formed between them that made sure that as tragic as the murders carried out were, there were those who either escaped or were allowed to escape and were able to speak of the tragedy of the Glencoe Massacre. The Scottish folk group, the Corries, wrote the song The Massacre of Glencoe, which pretty much summed up what took place on the 13th of February 1692, with one verse being, Some died in their beds at the hands of the foe, some fled in the night, were lost in the snow. Some lived to accuse him what struck the first blow, but gone was the house of MacDonald. Also, if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you will be interested to know that the Red Wedding, which was a revenge massacre for breaking a marriage pact, was based on two of Scotland's real-life historical events, one of which was the Glencoe Massacre. Well, I hope you have enjoyed finding out a wee bit of Scottish history. If you'd like to hear more about murders that have taken place in Scotland, then we hope you'll give Scottish Murders a listen. You can find us wherever you listen to your podcasts, or visit scottishmurders.com for all episodes, social materials, photos, and more. Hi, this is Kelly. And this is Jenna. And you're listening to ODFM. This episode is One Descent from Murder. This is a story out of Belgium. So on November 18th of 2006, 12 members of a parachute club went on their weekly skydive where they flew over Flanders. It's the northern portion of Belgium. On this dive, four divers, two men and two women, had planned to link hands in the air to create a quartet and then release hands like so that they could engage their parachutes, right? One of the women 
whose name was Els Van Doren. She disengaged from the others. Both her primary and reserve parachutes failed to deploy. I knew you were going (laughs) to... She plummeted to her death from a height of more than two miles. Which was over 4,000 feet. God. And landed in the back garden of a home in the town of Oblavik. The residents of the home came out of their house when they heard a loud thud in their garden and rushed out and just found this horrific scene. Police arrived and questioned the skydiving instructor, Marcel Summers. He told police that he, Els, and two others had planned to link hands and do this free fall in a star formation. But the other woman had jumped a little bit too late and she wasn't able to link up with them. So it really ended up just being Els and the two men. So they didn't do the quartet. It ended up just being a threesome. threesome. <laughs> right. Uh, uh. Marcel explained that after signaling for the group that it was time to deploy their shoots, he saw that Els was in trouble and he tried to move closer to help her, but he couldn't reach her in time. Even more nightmarish. Oh, no. This entire jump was recorded on the woman's helmet camera. Police retrieve the video and they watch it and it begins as a normal dive other than the one woman didn't jump in time once the three people stopped linking hands she went to deploy her chute and it failed police saw that her pilot chute which is a mini parachute that automatically deploys before the main parachute opens when she went to deploy her parachute That thing just blew away. Els was an experienced diver. She frantically tried to deploy her reserve chute like she knew what to do, but it also failed. (gasps) And she screamed for more than a mile of her fall. (gasps) Just screamed. Based on what they saw in the video, police were immediately suspicious that her parachute had been sabotaged. They went to examine her chute, and what they found was that the cords to her chutes had been deliberately cut. Oh, no. So it wasn't like they had torn in the air or something. It was... Right. So, of course, I have to look into her. Els Van Doren was a 37-year-old married mother of two. She was an experienced skydiver who had performed more than 2,000 jumps in her lifetime. Oh. And on the weekends, she went skydiving with her parachute club. So investigators start digging more into her, and they find out that Els was, in fact, living a double life. She had more than just a love for skydiving. She was having a years-long affair with another member of the club, oh. her instructor, Marcel Summers. Uh-oh. When she would spend the weekend skydiving, she would also spend the night at his place. Oh, that's convenient. The weekend before her death, Els was staying at Marcel's apartment when her friend and fellow parachute member Babs showed up. Babs? Babs' full name was Els Cottesman. This Els was a 26-year-old primary school teacher who joined the club just two years prior. And when the women became friends, Els Clodisman. She took on the nickname of Babs to avoid confusion between the two. Babs was the other woman who was supposed to make up the quartet on the day of the incident. When she didn't jump in time to form the maneuvers they were supposed to do, Mm -hmm. she actually watched the whole thing from the plane. (sighs) investigators decided to ask her to come in and give another statement. Just before she was supposed to come in to give this second statement, Babs attempted suicide. So now police are like... This is very suspicious. Does she have something to do with this? Right. While she's in recovery or whatever, investigators are like, maybe we should dig into Babs. Yeah. So they do. And it turned out that Marcel was also having a relationship (laughs) with Babs. And Babs was aware that she wasn't the only woman. Police found out that Babs had sent anonymous letters to Els Van Doren's husband telling him about Els' affair with the skydiving instructor. Oh, so, so maybe not so she, open. Yeah, I was going to say, so she's not so happy with it, I don't believe. And Babs also made countless anonymous phone calls to Marcel. She's a She likes stirring the pot. So police find out that a few days before the incident, Babs showed up at Marcel's apartment unannounced. Both women ended up spending the night what? at Marcel's place. However, <sighs> Els Van Doren slept with Marcel in his bedroom oh. and Babs slept on the couch in the living room. Oh, Babs is hurting. She is... She's Which fuming, happened to be close to where the parachute gear was being <gasps> stored. Because you That's know, handy. There was okay. one article I read that said that she was pissed because she could hear the lovemaking from the other room. Ah, why'd you go there then? 
Babs insists that she had nothing to do with her friend's death. She told police that she had a close relationship with both Els and Marcel. Although, if that was the case, why would she be trying to sabotage her friend's yeah. marriage? She described it as that Marcel at one point had, in quotes, led her astray. And oh, that they him. had a brief relationship that fizzled out. So he seduced her, I guess. Oh, okay. So it's all according to Babs. And that was just a short-lived thing. So, but prosecutors thought there was motive Mm -hmm. (laughs) and there was the means for her to do this. So they decided to go ahead and charge her with murder. Um, And this was just two months after Els Van Doren's death. While she awaited trial, Babs told the media, quote, I always knew I was number two for Marcel and Els was number one. I never had a problem with this at the time as I had such a low image of myself that I could only ever imagine being number two. Babs claimed that Els was aware of the short relationship she had with Marcel, but that they were close friends. Babs was released on bail in January of 2008 while she awaited trial. Finally, in September of 2010, the trial began. wow. Yeah, long time, because this started in 2006. She was placed on suicide watch during the trial. The jury got to see the video from (gasps) Els' helmet cam. No. Documenting her death. That was shown to the jury. That's pretty damning, right? Marcel Summers testified that Els Van Doren was the love of his life. He admitted to a brief relationship with Babs, but that he had ended it and that she didn't exactly go quietly. As he put it when he testified, he couldn't shake her. He testified that Babs showed up to his home uninvited. So Friday night, he had Els over. He didn't expect her and she wouldn't leave. Oh, no. So they offered to let her sleep in the living room. How awkward. And that, yes, Elle's skydiving gear was left, Mm -hmm. like, in the hallway right there where she Mm -hmm. had access to it. They had experts that testified that with Babs' skydiving experience, it would have only taken her 30 seconds to find and cut the parachute cords with scissors. Like, she could have done it just, she would have known exactly what to cut. Prosecutors entered into evidence anonymous letters that they proved that Bab wrote to mutual friends about Elle's affair with Marcel, showing that Babs was pathologically unstable at the time of the incident (laughs) is what they were trying to prove. Belgian court psychiatrists declared Babs to be, quote, a danger to society and to be, quote, a psychopath with dramatic features. (laughs) Bab's defense team argued that the case against her was purely circumstantial, that there was no evidence found to tie Babs to the sabotage parachute, just that she had motive and opportunity. That's a pretty big motive. (laughs) Her lawyer said, quote, my client has evolved since her release in January of 2008. Yes, she has evolved. (laughs) Exactly. And that she doesn't behave like a psychopath. She has started working as a teacher again. This is exactly who we want around kids. Ultimately, thank goodness the jury didn't agree. In October of 2010, Babs was found guilty, but the judge took her, quote, feeble psychological condition (gasps) as extenuating circumstances. And rather than sentencing her to life behind bars, she received a sentence of 30 years. And is she still around children? Let's hope (sighs) not. Hopefully she's not teaching from her cell. Yeah. So for Valentine's Day. Mm, Love is in the air. Good. Thank you for sharing. And if you guys want to hear more of ODFM, find out all the D words (laughs) by ODFM podcast. Get the D. Thank you, Darkcast Network. Thank you, Darkcast. We hope this date was one you can tell your friends about. Please join us for the dessert portion of our not-so-sweet sweetheart special so we can woo you with our decadent chocolate lava cake and spooky stories.